and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming tonight to this Behind the Musical seminar. Uh, thank you for coming to this new space for us. I would like to give a huge thank you to the Drama Guild Fund. This is their new office that they just had a grand opening two weeks ago. So uh, we're sort of initiating this room for seminars and reading series and things like that. So thank you to the Drama Guild Fund, Seth Powderman and Rachel Ruth, Gretchen Fryer, all the great folks there. This room is actually called the Music Hall. Uh, it's been sponsored by Carol Hall and her foundation, and she has made it possible for writers to use this space for free, for readings, for rehearsals, for whatever you want to use it for. So if you're interested in coming back to this space and doing something here, you just need to go to the Drama Skill Fund website, which is dgfund.org. And there's a link called um, Programs. And at the bottom of the Programs page is a link to look at the form for the music hall. So I recommend everyone come and have your rehearsal or your readings here. As you can see, it's very restful, very nice, even though we're across the street from Port Authority. So. Um, <laughs> but it's much better than what's going on at the Dramatist Guild right now, where they're completely gutting floors uh, six and eight, and we're on floor seven. So. Uh, if I could please ask you to turn your phones on vibrate. We're happy for you to tweet and post on Facebook and do all sorts of things, but if you could have your phones on vibrate, it won't disturb the performers or the songwriters for our internet audience. Uh, to our internet audience, hello. If you want to tweet a question for anyone on our panel or our lovely moderator, you need to do hashtag new play. Actually, that's for everybody. If you have a question and we haven't gotten to you yet, hashtag new play on Twitter. I'd like to thank all of the performers for taking time out of their busy schedules to do this for us. We thank you very much. All of their names are on the back of your program. So if you love and enjoy them, you can Google them and try to find out where to see them next. And just a little plug for the Drama the Skilled. As many of you know, we're having a conference this year in La Jolla, California. And the early bird deadline is May 1st. So if you want to come for a steeply discounted price and see many sessions like this and learn a lot about writing, you should come to the conference and pay the early bird price. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Michael Ian Walker and Kyle Alt, who are the producers and the originators of the Behind the Musical program. Adjust the camera so we can both fit in the frame, right? Uh, <laughs> casually. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's really exciting for us to be one doing the show with the Drama Skill, but two to be producing tonight and not be a part of it. This is the first uh, behind the musical that we are not a part of, and we're super excited about that. Uh, and we're also incredibly thrilled and honored to have the wonderful, the fabulous Kirsten Child here to moderate tonight. Um, I'm sure you all know her many. Uh, talents and, and all of her shows. Uh, Bubbly Black Girl Sheds Her Chameleon Skin is an awesome show that I saw when I was younger and I loved. Um, so uh, without further ado, she's going to take us away and start with our first songwriter. Again, thank you all for coming. Sorry, and for anything? watching. And for watching. Tweet your questions. Hashtag new play. Thanks, guys. Well, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, and now we're going to start the evening which actually today is the day of the 2015 Tony nominations. And as usual, they are all overwhelmingly wonderful choices. And also as usual, they are all overwhelmingly white and overwhelmingly male, um, which uh, there are exceptions, but I think that's a pretty fair statement. So I'm curious and per I'm sure you are curious as to what this says about the state of America, United States American theater, and should we care? And if we should, and if we should care, why? And if we shouldn't care, why not? So these and other questions are things that we're perhaps going to discuss tonight. But before we do that, I would like to introduce you to three amazing, well, two amazing musical theater writers and one amazing musical theater writing team. Um, and I just want them to come up here and show their work that nothing about diversity just or if they want to discuss the diversity while they're showing their work they're perfectly welcome to but i want you to see their unique voices so the very first person that we're going to bring up is michael jackson so i 
a little disclaimer. I, I teach at NYU graduate musical writing, uh, graduate musical theater writing program, and Michael went to the school, and he is, I'm, you know, a little biased. I think he's absolutely phenomenal. So, so there you have it. But I want, I would like for you to talk a little bit about your work, Michael. So, what, what would you, what would you like to talk about? Um, well, I, uh, well, I guess, like, one thing to know about me is that, like, I'm a musical theater writer who sort of came to it in a very extremely roundabout way, which mm -hmm. was that I started off in high school as a fiction and poetry writer who okay. then a teacher just offhand said that something I had written um, struck her as being very cinematic, mm -hmm. which then just led me to, on a whim, apply to the playwriting program at NYU as an undergrad, even though I'd never written a play. And then I got into that program somehow. And then... So, but had you seen musicals? I had seen... No, I had loved musicals, like, my whole life. And my mother... That was something my mother and I used to always do. Um, and I was... In a, as a, a kid, I was in shows. And so I, I definitely had a love of musical theater. But um, I didn't think... Just like I, I didn't think that people wrote musicals. I just thought they sort of, like... Like in a musical, just sort of happened. Like, they just sort of, you know... Goodness. And so, like, when I went, I studied playwriting, and then um, one of my teachers, Martin Epstein, who used to mm -hmm. teach at uh, the grad program. Wonderful, at, wonderful. Dramatic writing pro program teacher and yeah. also musical theater writing program. And he, he just one day on a whim said, is anyone interested in a musical theater writing program? And I just said, well, I like musicals. So then I just went to the open house, and I was like, oh, this seems like a cool program. And then I just applied to it on a whim. And then I got into the program, even though I'd never written a musical before. But then the way the program is set up, structured, you sort of, uh, everyone sort of starts on the same page, and then you sort of figure out where you fit in. And I was not a music person in the program, and I had no aspirations to be a music person. Though I did have a music, somewhat of a music background, because I played piano growing up. But um, once I studied lyric writing, that gave me a, a, a strong foundation for musical ideas that I had. And so then it wasn't until the end of the first year we had another class where a teacher said, if you're a lyricist who's never written music, you can try bringing it in for this class. And so then I just, on a whim, decided to try writing a song for this class. And the song went, which, one, which is one of the songs I'm going to do tonight. It was the first song that I wrote. And then I was encouraged to continue writing my own music. So like my like intersection with musical theater like I know we're talking about like diversity in in one context but I would one thing that I sort of am interested in bringing in is sort of like how we how everyone sort of connects with the form itself mm -hmm. and I think there's a lot of questions about diversity in that because like I came into musical theater in a extremely roundabout way and that had nothing to do with like necessarily with like skin color or economic background well I guess that might have had a little to do with it but like there's a lot of factors that mm -hmm. go in for me that go into the the word diversity and right. I, I'm interested in sort of unpacking that word even well that's a perfect segue into present presenting this song I'm assuming that this is the song or is this another song this is another one okay. that but that's part of it. that song is part of my set okay well why don't you talk a little bit about the song you're about to present uh, the song I'm about to present is it started off as a out as a standalone song for a show that I've been developing for a while called a strange loop mm -hmm. um, which a strange loop and uh, it's about a black gay male musical theater writer who works as an usher at the Lion King and <laughs> Uh, he sort of is having like, I guess you could call it an sort of existential sort of crisis about sort of his many identities, um, musical theater writing included. And uh, in the piece, sort of his thoughts are personified and they sort of play like his parents, they play like student loan, you know, evil people who want all your money. They play like <laughs> men on, like on Grindr and stuff like that and sort of all of that plays out. It, it, it all, it all, the whole spectrum of like sort of uh, problems and issues and questions that he's having about himself and who he is, and um, and this song, which is currently in the show, but I might actually be about to cut it. But it's one that I had that like is a. It has a statement that mm -hmm. I think was important for me personally, but 
in the, but also for the character. So. And what's the name of the song? It's called Second Wave. Second Wave, all right. Through, we did a reading and like we just got to get in a room full of actors and like go through the piece and like just having that time and that space to do that um, 
just in going moment by moment, like you sort of feel sort of what's right and what's wrong and like what's not working. And like, and we cut actually quite a lot mm -hmm. for the purpose of the reading. And it was really for uh, the detriment. We didn't cut that from the reading, but mm -hmm. in sort of a subsequent discussion with my director, we just had been questioning it. But I think it just really depends. It's really a question of like, if you're just having like a double dramatic beat or sort of wondering about the dramatic function of the song itself. Mm -hmm. Um, and this one was sort of a late entry into the piece, which is why I'm not fully ready to cut it, but mm -hmm. um, it's one that's resonated, oddly enough, <laughs> with people when I've like performed yeah. it. So, <laughs> which has been a, like a very strange thing for me, because I was like very nervous about it when I first presented it, so. Well, I think it's a terrific song, and you know what, if you do cut it, it will be part of, you know, the trunk song. The trunk of song, dead ba of dead babies, <laughs> dead baby trunk song. The dead baby yeah. trunk song. <laughs> okay, so, um, this work that you're on, you're working on, how far along are you with it, the one that you Well, it's interesting because this particular piece has, again, talking about like diversity and sort of my roundabout ways. Like I, this piece started off as a monologue that I wrote right after college, like t over 10 years ago. Okay. Um, and like, and it was before I started writing musicals. And so like, it started off with that monologue, and then I started writing the songs at mm -hmm. NYU, and then I started trying to put those songs with the monologue, and then I started working with the director, and we started shaping the piece, and it just started taking its own little unique shape. Mm -hmm. um, because it's such a personal piece, um, it sort of defies the typical sort of um, dramaturgy right. that would normally go into a, a more uh, conventional book musical. Mm -hmm. And so just finding the, the right temperament the, the and it. the flow of it mm -hmm. uh, uh, was, was really a challenge for me over the many, many years. And it wasn't actually until I went, uh, I started working at the Musical Theater Factory and I got a deadline. I found that like the deadline. thing that like, that actually is my best friend is a deadline. <laughs> and then and uh, Shakina, uh, who's artistic director at Musical Theater Factory, gave me a deadline for the reading. And then I just happened to get a a week-long residence fee at good speed with the Johnny Mercer um, Writers Colony. Mm -hmm. And then I used that time there and the support of that really awesome group of people to like get me a little further along. Okay. And then uh, we had the reading, and so it's just been a lot of incremental steps to, to uh, getting the piece in the shape that it's in now. So now I'm just like working on some rewrites on mm -hmm. it, and like I'm uh, doing some sort of R&D to figure out about recording a demo. Mm -hmm. So like just little baby steps. I Last night I uh, had the uh, honor of being one of the uh, one of the writers group, writers who was selected to uh, represent the Johnny Mercer group at 54 Below oh, fantastic. Um, last night. So mm -hmm. that was really awesome. So okay, well why don't we go to your next song? Okay. And, and why don't you set this up as well? Uh, this next song is also from the show. It's called, and it's the first, it's uh, the song that I wrote in the NYU course that uh, mm -hmm. sort of propelled me to the continue one we writing. we were discussing yeah, before. I was saying mm -hmm. this before. Mm -hmm. And it's called Memory Song, and it was just a song that I wrote. The, in, the thing about the song that's like, both sort of the seed for the piece and just important for me is that like, one thing that the teacher, Mike Reed, said was like the best argument. I want to tell them who Mike Reed Mike is. Reed was one of the teachers at NYU who was our chair's collaborator, Sarah Schlesinger. And he also was uh, the writer of the song, I Can Make You Love Me, um, that Bonnie Wright sings. And one thing that he said to me that has always stuck with me and sort of been like a sort of a, a touchstone for me is the argument against work that you hate is your own which is another way of saying, be the change that you want to see in the world. And so I sort of always think about that in that I feel like I'm a demographic that is not necessarily, um, I'm a consumer. And I consume media, I consume entertainment, I consume theater, but I'm not necessarily a demographic that anyone is trying to market to, for example. And so, the thing that I started doing with this song and eventually with a lot of my work was to create the things that I would want to see as someone who is a consumer. Um, and so this song is one that is like for and about black gay men and that experience, which I know a lot about, but it's also something that like I offer up to an audience to sort of uh, have their own 
connection to. Okay, great. And the song is titled again? It's is called Memory Song. Memory Song.
said the industry will always be the industry. So I have given up, given up about what others think about me. Whether I hit my mark or jump a shark or lose my spark and they doubt me, I will follow, follow my dreams. My singer has to leave for his uh, 7 p.m. show, oh. so could we actually start from the, the, the first song, and then I'll talk later. Why don't you? <laughs> sure. I would really love to hear a song by uh, you. So Why don't you tell me a little bit about the song you're going to uh, so, present? So uh, the first song that I'm going to uh, present is a song from uh, the United States of Us. Uh, the United States of Us. Actually, it reflects the theme that we're going to cover tonight. Uh -huh. um, it's a show about diversity. Okay, so why don't we stop there and let your singer sing and then we'll okay. come back. Just tell us the, okay. the title of the song. Uh -huh. uh, Corbett Williams here uh, is going to sing Connecticut. We're at 
after deep consideration, I am moving out of town to a pleasant destination where no one wears a frown. A suburban world so retro waits a metro right away. Though this move may seem abrupt, you will see it's for our nut troll day. for some legal hanky-panky and if New York tries to tantalize I'll simply say no thank you yes sir I'm getting married in Connecticut cause in Connecticut it's the place for me and you dance break <laughs> if you are looking for something great travel on down something to do with diversity, would you, yes. would you like to um, talk a little bit about what that song is from? And, and yes, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, so the song is from the show that I wrote with uh, Libertist Alan Gordon, who's singing, uh, who's sitting back there. It's terrific. It's <laughs> and it's called The United States of Us. Mm -hmm. And it's a story about um, two outsiders forming uh, this very unusual family unit and trying to uh, maintain it and maintain the normality, the sanity. <laughs> right, right, and right. The, uh, the story starts in 1998 okay. when Ken, our protagonist, a gay guy, um, agrees to marry Esmeralda. Um, she's very, very pregnant, um, illegal immigrant lady from uh, Colombia oh, with, okay. with expired visa. So uh, he agrees to marry her, and while they were uh, raising her child together, they bond. But the threat of, uh, you know, the pressure of uh, deceiving the, both the outside world and their own son takes the day toll. Mm -hmm. And then the last threat comes um, in around the second act. Uh, time passes by, and uh, the possibility of the, the same sex marriage coming to New York City um, becomes the biggest threat to, you know, for, for, to this family, unusual family. So uh, the song that just uh, Corbett just sang was uh, from Second Act, mm -hmm. and um, he was actually the the, the protagonist uh, colleague, and he was uh, really excited that the um, you know he get to get he get to married in Connecticut um, because it was um, and it was before the same sex marriage was legal in New York. Right, right, right. So yeah, that was that. What a fun song! Thank Want you. to see the show? <laughs> <laughs> um, so. You have worked on, I know you've worked with a bunch of different collaborators, mm -hmm. and um, and also I think you've done some work outside of the country, is this 
Yes. Do you want to talk about, well, I would like you to talk about that, but also, what, what do you get your inspiration from? Um, I uh, just try to skip the, you know, uh, keep my imagination spinning. Mm -hmm. I try to watch a lot of TV, <laughs> which is not really good for me. But I try to read a lot too, and you know, I try to find uh, inspiration from other media as well, like a painting and like books, plays. Mm -hmm. So just yeah, just others where, where yeah. it takes you. Yeah. Um, and but talk about working in the United States as opposed to working in other countries because I, I think that's, I don't know if the other songwriting team, this is also something that happens with them, but I know that it is something that you do a lot of work here in the country and also outside of the country. Yes. Are there different challenges to working um, here as opposed to working elsewhere or, or vice versa? Actually, um, I don't know, it all depends on, you know, person. Mm -hmm. But uh, from my experience, I was born in Korea, mm -hmm. and I studied music until uh, my early 20s. Mm -hmm. So I came here pretty late, you know, okay. and I happened to be uh, working in the theater based in New York City. Okay. Um, for me, the challenges that I'm facing here is um, probably um, because I'm a Korean composer mm -hmm. and trying to make it ma mainstream here in the city uh, rather than the, 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 the challenges that the female composers have. Mm -hmm. So I don't feel that yet, uh -huh. honestly. But when I work Good. <laughs> <laughs> but when I work in Korea, it's a little bit different there because uh, I mean Korea definitely has some gender bias. Mm -hmm. but Typically, music and theater industry is kind of um, not so much male-dominated mm -hmm. field, I would say. That's so that part is definitely a fortunate, you know, part mm -hmm. for me. But because the industry is very young and mm -hmm. still developing, it has to, you know, improve a little bit. But even it's more, burgeoning in, yeah. in Korea. Yes, it's as opposed totally to a lot of other different countries. It's a big. There are it's big, big industry, mm -hmm. and it's definitely blooming mm -hmm. and it's gonna get bigger I hope but still the the interests are more like um, imp uh, the importing licensed musical from Broadway and West End and other European countries so for uh, writers uh, you know Korean writers we have so many great great talents all over like they studied abroad, mm -hmm. particularly here in, in New York, mm -hmm. NYU teach music theory writing program and BMI as sure. well. And mm -hmm. we have, um, um, yeah, <laughs> and other colleagues who study in London mm -hmm. or like other countries, and they will go back to Korea and try to develop their own pieces for Korean audience. But because the public interest is kind of, you know, more towards, um, you know, blockbust the Western musicals. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely a challenging environment. Well, we don't want to hear Western musicals right now. <laughs> well, or we want to hear Western musicals that you're writing or whatever kind of musical that you are writing. Why don't we listen to your next um, song? Why don't you set it up? Okay, so the next song is going to be uh, from a show called Better Than Dreaming that I wrote with libertist Alan Gordon again. <laughs> and it's Hi, a uh, <laughs> loose adaptation of Shakespeare's um, the Midsummer Night's Dream. Oh, fantastic. And it uh, takes place in the modern day Central Park in New York City. And in this song, uh, our uh, heroine Mia uh, and her lover Lyman are serenading each other before they plan to elope oh. into the park <laughs> later. Okay. So please welcome Sarah Holland and Sky Seals. What do I give up? What would I give up? What would I give up? Yeah. Okay. Then let's get married right away. And forget about the money. Would you do that? Would you give up a fortune to marry me? Depends. How much money? Seriously. 
What would I be giving up if I love you? How about I take you on a quick little tour? Let's start with that nice condo with the park side view. Twelve rooms on the thirty. Um, you know, what we're doing is very um, American art form, right. even in Korea. So it's very Western, you know, the contemporary or pop, musical theater-ish music that, you know, they're um, familiar with as well. It's the same as here. But the story-wise, it's more, you know, the Korean culture and their story. Mm -hmm. um, Yes. So, but the fil you're, it's working through you, the filter of you. So, uh -huh. how, do, how do you think your background maybe ch changes it or uh, does anything to it? If anything, does it? Ah. Actually, um, that part I really have to start working on mm -hmm. because I haven't really uh, written anything from my culture, mm -hmm. honestly. And I always You don't have to work on it. If, you, if it's not broke, don't fix it. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I was, uh, because I was cr classically trained, mm -hmm. and that's Western music. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's why, um, you know, I, I didn't really get to study Korean traditional music mm -hmm. or, you know, Eastern music. But that part I will cover definitely soon. And... Um, yeah. Okay. That's it. <laughs> yes, I see a couple more questions. Sue and yeah, I don't know your name. Laura. Loris and then Laura. Hi. Uh, are the musicals that are presented in Korea, are they done in Korean or are they done in English? Uh, in Korean. Oh, so they're, they're translated? Yeah. No, uh, actually uh, from, the, from the beginning, like a stage when I Work with my work with my uh, librettist and lyricists. We write in Korean language, so uh, there's no uh, translation. Uh, there's no need for no it. No need for it. Mm -hmm. yes. And Laura. Uh, 
Um, I immediately heard your classical training when you sat down at the piano, and I also come from the opera world, and I transitioned from opera into musical comedy. And I was curious, because you said you work in a lot of different languages, and I think that's global, and I feel like I'm one of the first global musical writers, because I've written um, musical comedy, or what's considered something on the cusp, with a, uh, a number of different languages in the choral pieces. And I'm curious whether you've ever tried anything like that, or whether you work in each individual culture, or each individual language separately. I, I think my case is more like the second, the, the later one. Yeah. So I, uh, you know, tend to write musicals for, I mean, uh, of, of their, uh, with their languages for their culture. Yeah. Uh, the, the most current one that, that's kind of freaking me out is I, I will be uh, writing a musical in <coughs> Japanese for Japan. <laughs> and I don't speak Japanese, <laughs> so I'm kind of freaking out. But you I am um, intrepid soul. I have every faith that it's going to be fabulous. <laughs> but I, I asked the uh, the Japanese libertist, libertist if she could, when she sent me the script, Japanese script, mm -hmm. along with the English English translated script, I asked her if she could read the lyrics really, really, really slowly and clearly so that I can hear the rhythm of the words mm -hmm. and so that I can scan the lyrics in the right way. Because I don't want to throw the audience off like, you know, by, by the wrong scansion. <laughs> right, well, what's actually what's so brilliant about what you do is I believe in Korea mm -hmm. that there is not, there's no rhyme, is that, is that? Actually, there is rhyme. Mm -hmm. that, I mean, I think as long as you have consonants and mm -hmm. vowels, there are rhymes. Mm -hmm. in, okay, so yeah. it's not. It's not. But it's a different yeah. kind of rhyme. But, but it's a different kind of li rhyme, and also, I think the order of sentence, the the, the order when you make sentence is kind of sim a little bit different, uh -huh. and in our uh, in Korean language, the we finish sentence with with verbs all the time. Okay. And the verbs are ending with kind of, a, I guess, eight or nine. I have to really count, but mm -hmm. eight or nine or 10-ish uh, combination of vowel and consonant. Okay. So that's why we get, you know, simpler, like rhymes. Mm -hmm. There are rhymes, but they are simpler, but than, simpler. than this language. Yeah. Okay. Well, on that note, why don't we Listen to your last song, the setup of it, and of the, and also uh, how um, are you having things workshopped? Um, this this next song that you're doing, it what what's happening with it aside from oh. talking about what it yes. is? Yes. Oh, and before the next song, mm -hmm. uh, this the song that I just presented from uh, is from uh, a show called uh, Better Than Dreaming, and it's gonna be. Uh, in the Santa Fe Musical Theater Festival next month. Fabulous, so, congratulations. Yeah, Alan and I are really, really uh, excited about it. Mm -hmm. And the next show, mm -hmm. so the uh, next show is uh, called the Little Miss Fix It. Uh, it's a show about an uh, 11 year old girl who's a uh, completely a uh, control freak. And uh, <laughs> she's really, really precautious. So uh, she reads the New York Times, drinks black coffee for breakfast and she really tries to bend spoons with her mind which is really crazy control freak <laughs> and her parents are going through some domestic problems about getting divorced and stuff like that and she uh, decides to dedicate herself to fix the problems of everyone around her and and she uh, discovers that, oh, she can control everything. And mm -hmm. sometimes when you let things go, great things happen. And uh, in this song, so she meets 12-year-old impressionist painter boy named David. And she is even more overwhelmed by the feelings comes with first love. 
Sounds great. And do you want to say who the collaborator is? Because oh, oh my God, I forgot the reporter. Well, I would not forget her name, and you're going to know why in a minute. The show is written with Kirsten Gwanter, a really, really, really great uh, lyricist, libretist. She's a fabulous who, uh, collaborator, and she has a great first name. <laughs> 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 and the song is called Totally Unorganized. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you. about them, so would you please welcome with me Dana Levinson and Stacey Weingarten. <laughs> so, thrilled to have you both here, so why don't you talk a little bit about how you, maybe what you're working on and how you two approach writing musicals together? Yeah, um, so right now we have two main projects that we're working on. Um, one is called Fifth Republic, which were actually Dramatist Guild fe Fellows as well, so we're working that on that nice. with the fellowship. Fit for uh, Public? Fifth Republic. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other is... The other one is called Jerome's, um, which is with another collaborator, Larry Hamilton, who's Who's actually back there? Concept. He's in the back. He's yeah. And it's not Al Jerome. <laughs> no. Okay. It's a different Jerome. Okay. Um, <laughs> and uh, Fifth Republic 
is uh, a show that takes place in 1958 in Paris. Okay. Um, and it is set against the backdrop of Charles de Gaulle's return to power, the Algerian War for Independence, um, and is a, um, well, we keep debating whether it's a war story or a love story, but well, so, you know, so that's to be war. determined. Yeah. But um, the main love story is between a French soldier mm -hmm. um, and an Algerian refugee named Leila. Okay. Um, and then, do you want to talk about Jeroz? Sure. Um, Jeroz is set in 1890s New Orleans. Um, in I'm getting a, a French sort of connection yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> so, we like historical fiction, which uh, has yeah. kind of fallen into that place. Um, but it's set uh, in a brothel in New Orleans okay. in 1890s, in Storyville. Um, but this brothel is a special brothel where all of the girls are actually boys, oh. which is based off of a real I, thing that happened at the mm -hmm. time. So it's based on like yeah. real historical events. And the tone of it is much more Southern Gothic rather than like Kinky Ooh. Boots. Yeah. So. And of course, because we're in New Orleans, there's a voodoo element. Cause well, there has to is be. that Marie Laveau? Is she? Does she figure into it at all? No. No. She no. Oh, she's bad. not in the, in a in a brothel in New Orleans. That <laughs> I mean, she could have been. She could have been. <laughs> exactly. um, yeah. So, also, the stuff we work on has a tendency to be very through sung in a lot of ways. Um, so there's a lot of going back and forth. Um, Stacy writes book. Okay. I do music and lyrics, but we're starting to collaborate on lyrics with each other as well. Oh, fantastic. Um, mm -hmm. But even when I'm doing lyrics on my own, there's a lot of back and forth. Stacy will send me a scene. I'll musicalize parts of it. I'll send it back to her. She'll adjust things mm -hmm. and then work very, very, very closely, closely together. So do you want to give us the first song and set it up and let us hear some of this? Yes. Is this going to be from the um, Charles de Gaulle one or from the... This is from Fifth Republic. Fifth, yeah. okay. Yeah. So, so um, Ben Rahula is going to play piano for us. And then I also want to bring up Jerry Ann Perez and Reese Gilead. Okay. Um, so this is our couple, Renee and Layla. Um, and... This is basically their first love duet. Yeah. I don't think it needs much more setup than that. That sounds love. <laughs> what can you say? Thank you. 
interested in telling I because you wanted to make one of your pieces gothic uh, you were saying and the other they seem to be a serious subject matter what is can you talk yeah. a little bit about the kinds of stories you're I mean, interested in? I guess at least when we collaborate they tend to mm -hmm. that in my other life I do children's stuff so like not the same yeah. mm -hmm. um, um, but we tend to yeah I think that the connective piece for us is that Stacy and I are both big believers in that art generally but theater I think has a special power to sort of build bridges between people and make mm -hmm. people that um, an audience might otherwise look at other force them to embrace that person mm -hmm. or acknowledge their humanity and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So I think the connective piece is we tend to be attracted to stories that have a strong social justice element to it. Mm -hmm. um, but also heart, there's a lot of heart in it. And yeah. they also tend to be stories of like a, a identity and finding your place mm -hmm. as yeah. far as like what the journey of whoever the character we're actually following is yeah. mm -hmm. and then set against a world that is a little bit that um, conspiring to uh, pull it apart. Yeah, yeah. And w are there any special challenges to trying to either create that or have it produced or you know? Well, I think <laughs> the big thing is having it produced. Yeah, I mean, well, I hate to tell you, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think that's for everybody. Yeah. But yeah. it might be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But but there are, but it, but that being said, there are also other challenges that sometimes are greater for people. Yeah, well, what I think a big part of the part of the issue for us is in terms of specifically more specifically what I mean by that is that these days in new musical theater there's not as much of a space mm -hmm. to try out new works of that have size and mm -hmm. like scope and mm -hmm. all of that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um so it's much harder to find development opportunities and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um also, when you're saying that size, are you anticipating, a, are you writing this for a really big cast? And uh, Large for today's standards, yeah. we'll say. Mm -hmm. So yeah. like, mm -hmm. the, of, I, our ideal would be to pl like play on the Broadway form of size, but mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that like we'd be like, oh, the show has to be on Broadway. It's yeah. just that we want a cast of like 20. And, yeah. and, and a big and orchestra. And yeah, yeah, exactly, which is hard so these nowadays, days. You know, good luck. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and yeah. and especially Fifth Republic, what's problematic is there's a mix of French music and Arabic music. Mm -hmm. So it also means that there's basically two bands that wow. need <laughs> for the musical storytelling to exist but as it, it needs have. to be. <laughs> I mean what what I think is admirable is that you're continuing it as if it's going to happen and who knows? It will, you know. Who knows? <laughs> we keep on joking. We need to find a small commercial story to, <laughs> to do instead. No, this this sounds really wonderful. Um, you know what? I'm going to throw it out to to the audience. Do you have a question to ask? Does anyone have a question? Yes, lady well, in purple, lovely purple. You isn't that purple? Yes. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Um, do you start with? a musical sound that you want for a song, because I'm always fascinated by the what the left hand does versus the melody. Yeah. Or do you start with the lyrics first? How do you start with change for you? Yeah, I used to write lyrics first, um, and I found that it played into my weaknesses as a lyricist, which was being overly verbose and mm -hmm. overly complicated and all of that. Um, so actually, um, Steve Lutvak, who wrote Gentleman's Guide, sure. suggested to me to try flipping around and mm -hmm. try writing music first. Mm -hmm. um, and I found for a while that was very helpful. I would outline a melody in a chord progression um, and then write a lyric to a melody that was already written. And now that I've sort of guarded myself and given myself an internal guard against some of my weaknesses as a lyricist, now I go back and forth sort of depending on whether the song should be more conversational, depending on what the moment is, all of that sort of stuff. 
Um, now these days I often ask Stacy to write me a scene stuff. and then I sort of musicalize elements of it and stuff like that. Yep. So. Wow. Good. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And then yes. Yeah. How do you, uh, what's your process once a director comes in and you both have already collaborated with Casey Sim? Well, I mean, we enjoy getting a like, bird's eye view of a piece. Yeah. Um, and we're, we pride ourselves on actually being very open to changing things. If, usually if we, we can acknowledge our problems and go, yeah, and then cut a song or change a scene. So for us, bringing in the outside eye actually is welcome to very helpful. Yeah. Because for us working together, we collaborate very closely. Yeah. And sometimes you can kind of be blind to, like, to solutions for yeah. problems at least. You might see that there's a problem, but go between us, like, we've gone, we've nixed all of the things that we think could solve it, or we've tried to solve it, and then getting a third person in helps go, oh, that's what that is. So. Yeah, and, and Fifth Republic, we've had a director attached, Donna Drake, for a long time, mm -hmm. and she's been very helpful in terms yeah, of... Yeah, kind of weeding out the story and making sure that everything remains clear. Mm -hmm. So, like, if we give her an outline, she goes, wait, I'm kind of lost right around here where we might not have even seen it, and then we look at it again and go, oh, you're right, that's yeah. where we lose the main character. So yeah. stuff like that is very helpful as well. And then Joyce, collaborator, oh. I, your name again? Alan. Alan, yes. A uh, question for Dana. When you were working with the sort of more Arabic music, mm -hmm. did you find that it changed how you uh, put together the songs, or was there a difference? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I started studying Arabic music with um, uh, Bassam Saba, who is the conductor of the New York Arabic Orchestra, um, and taught myself, not taught myself, started to teach myself the oud, then started taking oud lessons. Um, and everything in Arabic music is first based around a rhythm. So I first like find the rhythm of the song that I want, and then start to build the melody into the rhythm. Um, and also often in Arabic music, it's all, <coughs> counterpoint and like there's no har harmonic structure even in the instrumentation so then the melody that I outline in the instrumental ends up not being the melody of the vocal so then I just start like improvising mm -hmm. vocals over whatever melody I've outlined and then go from there um, for for that kind of composition do you find that it's harder sometimes for the performer to grasp the singing of it as opposed to when it's done in a yeah. classical European sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's one of the things that we've struggled with in terms of authenticity versus commercial viability mm -hmm. and accessibility yeah. for a Western Striking audience. Striking a balance between the two styles and seeing kind of how to make that feel commercially viable without leaving one in the dust. Yeah. Sort of. Any other questions before we go on to, I think we have to actually go on to the, the next part, so why don't you introduce the next song and, and cool. sort of talk a little bit um, about it. So we're going to bring Reese back out. Yes. Are you there? there you <laughs> um, this is also from Fifth Republic. Okay. Um, it's a different character, not the one that Reese was singing before. Mm -hmm. um, we have the character of Pierre, who's sort of this um, Che and Evita archetype sort okay. of give narrating giving yeah, us gives a political context mm -hmm. for the show and then kind of guides our eye from the moment to moment. Um, so this is his big act two solo and it's sort of his message for warmongers out there during this war and then eventually encouraging them or you'll, yeah. oh, well, you'll oh, see okay. um, <laughs> and then but eventually becomes a self-reflective moment for him which is I think the first time we're ever really getting that from that character yeah. in this show. Yeah. Okay. And the title is? Uh, Do They Notice. Do They Notice, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Did I leave a door unlatched? Were the shades left too high? Yes, moments fly swiftly 
yet I am still glued to this spot. Where is LaGuardia? Come on, where is the fanfare for those that the history forgot? Still I wait. Still I wonder. Do they notice? Do they spare these lives of thought? Yes, do they notice? All the grief that they ought to. Do they notice? That as all the world moves on, they're still aching and grieving with zeal for an empire of God. Tell me how we came to this and abandoned filthy flat. Is this some foolish joke? How did our torments run out? How did our what ifs expire just like this stagnant smoke? We chose a path. Steal the uncertain, and now I am left with the bill. Live with your choice, I know. Move past remorse, but if I don't remember, who will? So I wait. So I wonder. Do they notice? Do they see they can't turn back? Yes, do they notice? Every fissure and crack, do they notice? That is all our leaders wave, sign their treaties, snap photos, and too many are left in the grave. Did they notice the telling signs of disaster and the tumult in stone? present your last song um, and tell us a little bit more about the, the piece that you're working on. And Great. Because we're all going to come back here and <laughs> talk some more. Yeah, but. yeah. Um, so the final song is from DeRose, mm -hmm. um, and Larry Hamilton is going to come up and sing this song. Um, Larry, the who's character. also one of the collaborators. Yes. 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 This whole show is Larry's baby, and oh. Larry brought it to us, and then we came on to this project with him and have been working on it now for a bit. Fantastic. And, um, so the character is Clea, and she's one of the girls in the brothel. Mm -hmm. um, and in the beginning of the show, she's sort of like a Bess and Porgy and Bess archetype. Mm -hmm. um, very low self-worth, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Um, and this is her big act two solo. Is there anything? Yeah, I mean, she ends up falling in love with a man from outside the brothel, from a different world okay. than she's in. And then he promises to take her outside of the brothel. For the first time Which ever. For a, yeah. And so she's, is she experiencing Ajita before leaving, or, um, or will little, I find that out? A little bit of self-doubt. I self, should stop asking a little questions bit, a little bit of, to the song. A little bit of, <laughs> <little bit> of, <laughs> of self-doubt, maybe. Yeah. Okay. As a reminder for anyone who might have forgotten, the girls in the brothel are boys. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah. Excellent. Perhaps. I could be some kind of happy If I can be free from the fight Yes, perhaps I could be Some kind of peaceful With no one to push me or slight Perhaps I could be some kind of happy if I have someone to rise. Yes, perhaps I could be some kind of hopeful if my bed is warm when I rise. It's time to throw up the past, cast it aside to make happiness last. Ain't no good reason to cling. Perhaps I could be 
some kind of happy if I had a home of my own. Yes, perhaps I could be some kind of steady with no one to scoff or to show. It's time to throw off this weight straight towards the cliff. Who knows what will await? Farewell to pain and blood. I had talked about the fact of the, the Tonys, the sort of, the nominations being sort of not that diverse. The, the what is it, the Oscars, we're not that diverse this year. And in this world of post-racial, you know, all lives matter, what does this say about the theater? Well, that's, no. That, that's really Fun know, Home that's is actually one of the, the exceptions to this, mm -hmm. but, but I mean, and that is thrilling that it is up and well deserved. But I mean, maybe it doesn't seem, maybe it isn't a big issue for people, you know? I mean, I guess I, I feel like there's so many levels to this because it's like the nominations are not that diverse, but like the shows that were could be nominated were not were more that, diverse. Well, no, I mean, we're, not we're not that diverse to begin with. So, like, mm -hmm. I'm a little bit of a, at a loss about like I don't like I feel like we like what comes first, the chicken or the egg, you know? So, well, what does come first? Yeah, I think it's it's not necessarily a. I think it starts with diversity in what's on Broadway. Okay. Um, and then, you know, because we were talking about this earlier, um, but that, as you were saying, it wasn't a particularly diverse season. I mean, you have, I mean, you had Disgraced, you have The King and I, mm -hmm. um, yeah, but, fun home. yeah, Fun Home, mm -hmm. um, and all of those shows got recognized mm -hmm. in the nominations, um, you know, so it's just, I think it's more of an issue of lack of 
diversity in what's being actually produced. Okay. Um, and, and, I, and I also want to clarify, I mean diversity not just in terms of race and ethnicity, I also mean in terms of experience and backgrounds and kinds of stories that are being told. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I think like another part of it is also like, it's kind of hard for me to sort of to think about diversity even within the context of this thing called Broadway. Like Broadway itself is like almost like a sort of like economic ecosystem in and of itself. And so like when I then think about like diversity. Off Broadway? Off Broadway? Off, off Broadway? I mean, yeah. So like, I mean, if you go off off Broadway, if you go, you know, to theater companies that are doing things in Brooklyn or in Astoria or mm -hmm. wherever or regionally, like there's so many other places where if you really are looking for like diversity, it's going to be in a lot of those other places because the people who are making the decisions themselves are either of communities that they want to represent or are interested in serving other communities. Whereas to me, Broadway is, is it's so money driven that like I almost understand why it is not more diverse because there's too much money is at stake for you to really factor that in unless you're willing to like potentially take losses because there's so you have to take a chance on right. like things that might not be popular or or, or money making you know well, but on that level but, but talk about taking chances what is the purpose of doing theater if it's not to take chances I absolutely That's agree that the yes. Broadway. Yeah. <laughs> but, but Broadway itself is just seems like this big juggernaut that's not necessarily about not not that it cannot be about that, mm -hmm. but that like at this in this time, at this moment, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily the being the conduit for that. But there are tons of other yeah. theatrical I uh, venues that like offer that, and I also I also think that there's sort of an assumption of certain stories being a risk. I think mm -hmm. because I mean some of us were also talking about earlier that like especially look at TV right now is more diverse than I think it ever has been, mm -hmm. and some of those shows are the most successful shows on television. Absolutely. So that that doesn't necessarily translate, but I do believe that the fear is there. Um, right. I think an interesting thing about. Um, the television, sort of like using the television comparison is that I think part of a big reason why television is becoming more diverse is because, or what we term as diverse, is because the people, those who are they, those who would make those decisions are recognizing that there is money to be made yes. from those communities. Yes. 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 Whereas I think theater is a little bit different because if the money that is to be made on, and I'm using specifically in terms of Broadway, I don't know that like producers have ne necessarily gone, ah, we can make money by appealing to these communities. If the the people who are going to the theater are like, ugh, I'm bored by all these white male, cisgender, you know, people like like plays and therefore I'm not gonna go see them until the theater becomes diverse, then I think suddenly you're gonna see like black, gay, trans woman, everything, because then, like, those people will be the ones who, like, are the economic life stream. Life stream. Yeah. It's yeah. for a selective audience right now, what, you know, the Broadway is there. And I think, yeah, maybe the problems are with the production companies, mm -hmm. you know, who are controlling the funding. But also, I think there's something about, something that we could, we writers could do as well, because I hear often that there are not so many leading or supportive roles for Asian actors to audition for. Mm -hmm. uh, other than King and I or Flower Drum Song and Saigon, and that's it. Mm -hmm. Or maybe Avenue Q for just one. <laughs> right. <laughs> that the, the Christmas Eve uh, right. character. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that that's our responsibility to mm -hmm. bring our community and bring a minority community into our writing so that we can create more roles for uh, actors from, you know, minority culture and also embrace the audience from minority culture as well. Okay. But what a, uh, you still also want to be successful in the commercial world. Yes. So what is the, you know, how do you weigh? I think, 
I, I think it's um, even though you take the material from specific culture, mm -hmm. if I don't know you artfully, really masterfully um, universal universalize it. Is that even a word? Universalize I think it, it is. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yes, skillfully um, know how to I don't know make it more universal mm -hmm. so that more people can relate themselves to mm -hmm. a bit, and then that's the way to attract, I mean, I don't know how to do it yet, <laughs> I'm still learning, but might be able to attract some money people, you know, producers, and um, make it out there. I also, I okay. also think that's a way that you, that what we were talking about before, mm -hmm. that you build bridges between communities of people, mm -hmm. where if you have a culture that people might not necessarily feel comfortable with mm -hmm. or know a lot about, that if you have a character or a story of that culture and make people relate to that character and care about them, mm -hmm. you know, with those universal themes that you were talking about, I think that that's helpful and important also. And I was just going to add, like, I think, like, another thing that's, like, really important is getting people who are telling these stories the access to those who are producing mm -hmm. um, a lot. And that's just something that you sort of learn as you're trying to do this, in, particularly in New York, is that, like, sometimes it can be hard to like, you might have the great story that's going to have those universal themes and have those diverse stories and characters and every that will, you know, do all of that work. But if you can't get it to the right channels to get it in the pipeline to mm -hmm. be seen, then like you're sort of in this vacuum. But what do you think about audience building? I mean, you know, because let's face it, you know, the predominant audience for Broadway shows is watching stories about themselves. Right. So how do you get people to come to the theater to watch stories about themselves that are perhaps not that that audience? Pray for them. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's really, ultimately, like, I believe in if there's a good story, ultimately the story is like what will win out, or if they're good mm -hmm. characters. The catch is, of course, getting people over the threshold of walking into the theater. Mm -hmm. So if you do have something that manages to get far enough that, let's say, you are on Broadway and you have a more um, diverse outlook in your show than what the audience would necessarily usually be, mm -hmm. you have to then be able to sell it to them. Mm -hmm. And that's where then it gets into the economics of what is Broadway right now, where people want to minimize the risk, but by minimizing risk, you minimize the chance that you have an even greater success. Right. Just because you're trying to, like, level out so that you hopefully lose less money than you could, but usually on that scale, theater is a losing endeavor, mm -hmm. money-wise. Right. Most shows don't recoup. Most, so like you're either going for your awards or you're going to last longer and hopefully recoup, but like the concept of running long enough to recoup doesn't is a newer thing right. in my understanding, So like just because of the nature of our current economy. And so people try to minimize their risk over a certain amount of time by simplifying what the story is, appealing to a broader group of people, and hoping that at least it's good enough to pass through. But that seems incredibly depressing <laughs> that you would have to sit there and you know try not try to create a story when you're trying to create a truth. You're trying to understand something about humanity, and then you have to go, yeah, but we'll. I mean, Will it be the, too threatening for that's somebody? The difference between what was network mm -hmm. television and what was what became cable mm -hmm. and premium. I mean, like, like in terms of appealing to a certain audience and demographic, and mm -hmm. hoping that because of the nature of how the network system was set up, mm -hmm. that you needed to appeal to those broad audiences because they were the people watching your programs. So you needed to make sure that you got as many people as possible, and then you each network kind of found their niche and what their audience ish was. Right, but that's something, but we are all writers and we mm -hmm. own our own work and we're not working for a culture right. that is saying, okay, this, demo, you know, we've done these studies and this will work for this group and this will, so let's <laughs> cobble it all together and make it really, really, that seems to be something that is problematic with trying yeah, to create it's definitely yeah. problematic. I, I definitely, definitely find it problematic because I think I think like a big part of the problem is that there's so because of so much money there's so much fear that like I'm gonna use my show as an example just because I've been having this it, this very interesting experience I alluded to it a bit when I entered my set and b before you go on we're gonna please don't leave because we want to hear your we want to hear your question. <laughs>
Which is that, like, I've written this show that is by design for, essentially for and about, like, black gay men, right? Which you would think that when you present that to a mostly not that audience, that people would be, like, disinterested or bored or whatever. Mm -hmm. But the experience that I have had in the last couple of times that I've presented it is mm -hmm. that people who are not of that background are interested in it. Mm -hmm. And, but like, and I feel like that would be the case with many other people's stories as well. But like, because that does not seem like the most obvious thing, like in trying to gain access, like you can't prove that to someone unless you like show them that that is the case. Right. And so I think that like actually using the sort of television thing as an example, like as soon as, like it kind of, if you can just show it, if you can just prove it, then like suddenly the, the, the gates start to open a little bit wider. And I also think part of the key of that, especially for you, is that you're brutally honest and you're, you're, un, you're just don't run from anything and you put, put it out there with good craft. Yeah. But before you go yeah. on, I want to have this lady ask her question. Um, I had my own company and I worked out in Times Square. I'm multilingual. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm very interested in what you were doing and talking about before. And I could hear, I can hear all the different cultures and all the different uh, presenters tonight. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. <clears throat> and it really fascinated me because my ear is attuned to all the different music in the world, but also to all the different languages. Mm -hmm. And my biggest client, or shouldn't be my, not my biggest client, but one of my main clients was In the Heights, okay. which was the first bilingual musical that came to Broadway. Mm -hmm. And it won every Tony Award. Mm -hmm. Every time you were in every category. It's a terrific show. So the interesting thing was when it first started, it was off Broadway and it was nurtured off Broadway. So you have to think of a place where you can nurture more diverse work, mm -hmm. whether it's multilingual work like what I'm trying to do, and I also am interested in intergenerational. I find that there's a preponderance of entirely too young people on the stage. Where is my generation? Where is my Absolutely. grandmother's generation? You know, that's what I'm looking for, too. But what I found when I was working with the marketing director to get the Hispanic community to come to see In the Heights, mm -hmm. and it was also the first rap musical, mm -hmm. was that the Hispanic community, and rightly so, did not feel that Broadway or Off-Broadway or any theater was representing them with dignity mm -hmm. and self-respect on Absolutely. a Broadway stage. Mm -hmm. And they almost resented West Side Story, in a sense, because that was the only time that they were represented. And I had worked with other um, Broadway and off-Broadway shows of Hispanic or Latin or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it was always the same thing, the community itself turned its back mm -hmm. on Broadway and on a, the American musical because it didn't represent them. Right. So I say to you, from my experience as a person in the marketing and audience development mm -hmm. arena, you have to s do what is true to you in your heart and in your soul and in your person when you are creating. But you also have to gather your community around you and ask them to get in the seats, mm -hmm. and then get other people to come and get in the seats, mm -hmm. and get on that internet, and talk to those people on the other parts of the world. So when they come to New York for their tourist, mm -hmm. tourist thing, tell them, don't go see this one, go see that one. Etc. From Laura's work. mouth. <laughs> From <laughs> Laura's <laughs> mouth. And I wish we could continue on, but I think it's time. For, am I, or do we have time for one more question? One more, and I would actually, what you can get first, but I would say, I know there's a lot of writers watching through the internet and in the audience. If there are places that you guys have found that are particularly supportive of diverse writers and places people can look, I think that would be cool to put a plug in and then question. Yes, and yeah. the last question. Just about in the heights, Kevin McCollum had that on his desk for two years, and you know the big thing with why that got pushed is he just liked a writer. It was a personal 
thing. Access. So, well, that, who could not yeah. like that writer? They, they, yeah. they yeah. just really yeah. absolutely he wonderful. He said, hey, I'm going to work with this guy. Yeah. That's how it happens, because most writers, nobody even reads the stuff Access. a lot of times. Mm -hmm. It just lays there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's some good stuff. I mean, disgraced, and you've had uh, the best thing in the past 10 years that I've seen was Carolyn and Change. Mm -hmm. oh, that closed in like three months. And it was honest, and it was brilliant. Loved it. But so to, it's a to different be, But to be now. fair, to be fair, there are many wonderful things that close in three months. Just yeah, that's, like, it, just that's, like, no. that's, yeah. that's exactly right. But that's so, where the market well, Let me just finish yeah. with sure. yeah. um, But um, I think part of the, what's missing, I mean, broad, commercial theater is commercial theater. Um, I uh, was on a panel uh, on gender equity for Dramatist Guild, gee, I think it was about five or six years ago. Okay. And the idea of putting producers together with writers, for me, is like crazy because writers, and you know, I, this should be produced. No, nobody's work should be produced. You know, it's, it'll be produced if they feel that it's good. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a, you know, it, theater doesn't function the way it used to way, way back, where there was right. a place for a lot of different types of work. Right. And you know it's a governmental issue too. People in other countries, it's like I want to write a play. The government will fund it, and then it's been removed. So there's got to be a place. We can't talk about Broadway. <laughs> there's got to, there've got to be other layers mm -hmm. where you. I have a production company. I pay for my own production because I believe in myself. If I don't believe in myself, who's going to believe? In that's that's a wonderful thing. Thank you. So well, I think all of these things. I think. All of these ideas are really wonderful, and I wish with all my heart, I hope success for everyone here on the panel, because you all deserve it. And I am just so thrilled to have experienced your work this afternoon, and I'm sure these people are as well. So on that note, we are ending this diversity panel. Congratulations. Thank you.